All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome, and thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Lee Lowry, and I'm the Executive Director of American School Health Association. We are pleased to present this timely webinar, Head Lice Treatment, Heading Off an Ancient Adversary, this evening. Before we get started, I'd like to share a little bit about the American School Health Association. Otherwise known as ASHA, we are the only organization that addresses multiple disciplines in school health and that is devoted solely to school health. Our membership of approximately 800 individuals represents school health as administrators at the local, state, and national levels, as health and educational, education professionals in a pre-K through 12 school setting, and as academics who conduct research that informs school health professionals. We're also the proud publishers of the Journal of School Health, a premier journal in the area of school and adolescent health. Members of ASHA can elect to receive a hard copy or electronic copy of the journal. Our membership fee is inexpensive and provides you access to the journal and also to our bi-weekly e-newsletter, School Health Action, as well as free continuing education hours through approved webinars and through CE qualifying Josh articles. If you haven't already, Please consider joining, volunteering, and becoming a member of the ASHA community. Visit us at ashaweb.org to learn more. Now, please allow me to introduce Linda Morse, ASHA's president. Linda served for more than 25 years as a health education specialist and certified school nurse at the local and state level in New Jersey. Thank you for joining us tonight, Linda. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Lee, can you move the slides, please? Oh, thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm here to uh, take you back through a few minutes, and uh, the slide says, remember when. If you're a school nurse, I'm sure you remember doing school-based head light screenings. If you were simply a student, perhaps now you're a teacher or a parent, you may remember standing in long lines where the school nurse spent hours and days checking every student's head for nits and lice. And what we know now is that the results were not very accurate, it was extremely time consuming, and it was very inefficient. And more importantly, we know now that it was totally unnecessary. Next slide, please. Times have changed. In April of 2015, the American Academy of Pediatrics released a clinical report, Head Lice, that states that no healthy child should be excluded from school or allowed to miss school time because of head lice or nits. No nit policies for return to school should be abandoned. Next slide, please. American School Health Association is committed to ensuring that students are healthy and actively engaged in learning. And it's the job of the entire school and community, and that includes parents, school health professionals, teachers, administrators, healthcare providers, and public health officials to ensure that students are not arbitrarily denied access to school based on outdated science. So, next slide please. Let's be reasonable. Any condition that impacts a student's attendance at school should be dealt with as both a health issue and a learning issue. And school policies that are not based on science and medical evidence and that contribute to absenteeism, stigma, and social and emotional issues, create an environment that is fear-based rather than supportive. If you may be familiar with the model that you see in front of you, it's uh, the new whole school, whole community, whole child model, commonly called WISC. And this is a new take on the coordinated school health model that was first, first posed by Diane Allensworth and Lloyd Colby back in 1987. This new model, which was created jointly by public health and education officials, requires us to take a system-based approach to health promotion in schools. You can see on the outside, um, it, the model is surrounded by the community. And it looks at both policies and practices that improve student health and student learning. So only when all members of the school and the community use common sense and work together can we address problems like a lice infestation in schools? So the game plan. As part of a whole child focused model, 
we can educate parents because they're the first line of offense against license infestation. We can educate our students on how to reduce transmission. We can ensure confidentiality and discretion to reduce teasing and bullying and social stigma. All those things that we all feared either as students standing in that line when the school nurse was doing those head checks or as the parent who gets that note home from the school nurse saying that your child potentially has headlights and can't come to school the next day. We can assist parents and caregivers to seek appropriate treatments, and every member of the school health team has an important role to play. So let's get started. A head lice infestation in your school does not have to be a public relations nightmare, nor does it need to be a public health dilemma. Today's session will focus on the latest information to help schools do the right thing to address this issue. Lee? Great. Thank you so much, Linda. Appreciate it. Um, okay, so a couple of notes before we begin. Your phones will remain muted for the 60-minute duration of this webinar. If you have a question for our pre presenter, please type them into the questions box on your screen. We will answer your questions today as time allows. All unanswered questions will be responded to and provided in a post-webinar email that you will receive this week. After the webinar ends, you will receive a short survey. Please take the time after the webinar to respond. The recording of our webinar will be emailed to you when it is uploaded. Now, let's get started with tonight's session. We're delighted to have Wendy Wright with us today, presenting Head Lice Treatment, Heading Off an Ancient Adversary. Here's a little more information about Wendy Wright. Wendy is a 1992 graduate of the Adult Primary Care Nurse Practitioner Program at Simmons College in Boston, Massachusetts and completed a Family Nurse Practitioner Post-Master's Program in 1995. She is an adult and family nurse practitioner and the owner of two nurse practitioner-owned and operated clinics within New Hampshire named Wright & Associates Family Health Care at Amherst and at Concord. In addition, she's the owner of Partners in Healthcare Education, a medical education company. She received the 2009 New Hampshire Nurse Practitioner of the Year the 2014 Top 5 Women in New Hampshire Business Award, and in 2005, she was inducted as a fellow into the American Academy of Nurse Practitioners, a position held by only 450 other nurse practitioners throughout the country. In October 2014, Wendy was also inducted as a fellow in the American Academy of Nursing. She's the founder of the New Hampshire Chamber of Entrepreneurial Nurse Practitioners, an organization designed to assist nurse practitioners with independent practice issues. In addition, she's an editor for Practice Mag Management, a new e-journal created for nurse practitioners interested in independent practice and practice management. She presents nationally to different audiences and has been a speaker at over 1,000 conferences in 46 states. Welcome, Wendy. I will now turn it over to you. Thank you all so much, and it is such it is really my pleasure to be here this evening. So. Uh, as you all heard, I am a family nurse practitioner, and I spend my days in the exam room taking care of thousands of children each year. This is not an issue that is uh, infrequently dealt with for me. This is something that we see on a regular basis, particularly this time of the year as the children are going back to school. So over the course of the next 45 or so minutes, what I'd like to do is hopefully dispel a bunch of myths for you. And I'd like to provide you with evidence-based information about head lice, how we treat them, how we can keep kids in school, and provide you with a number of resources for the children that you are dealing with and their families. So when you take a look at this next slide, if you take a look at the top of the slide, you're going to see that there's actually a louse located on a hair shaft. This is what these, these head louse or lice look like under an electron microscope. In fact, they're quite scary looking. We're also, as I mentioned to you, going to talk about head lice treatment, and I'm going to provide you again with those educational resources. Head lice are actually the most common human parasitic infection out there. And head lice occur wherever there are humans. In fact, back in the early 1940s and 50s, Head lice were actually treated with DDT, 
Well, obviously, that's a banned pesticide at this point. But I just to give you that information to really illustrate to you that this is not a new occurrence, that head lice have been around for hundreds of years. And uh, thankfully, we now have a good option, a bunch of good options to actually treat our children and their families with head lice. So as I mentioned to you, pediculosis, or head lice, is the most prevalent parasitic infection amongst men. They're they are pervasive among school-age children. In fact, when we look at the age of head lice, most cases of head lice actually occur in children between 3 and 11 years of age, more commonly girls. And this translates to over 6 to 12 million infestations occurring every single year. Now, people often say, why not 13 or 14 or 15? Hopefully by this point in a child's life, they've really learned from their family members, from their parents, that really close contact with another child's head is how lice is going to be transmitted. Kids tend to not be hugging each other nearly as much as they get a little bit older. So we tend to see the prevalence really start to drop off after that 11-year mark. But the biggest myth that I really want to dispel tonight is about head lice in terms of socioeconomic groups, in terms of dirty hair, et cetera. And you know, I've had a lot of parents say to me, this is so embarrassing, I can't believe my, he my kid has head lice. In fact, if my kid is clean. You know, unlike things like babies, head lice actually prefer really clean, healthy hosts. So uh, when I talk to parents and I joke with them and I say, you know, if you really don't want your kid to get head lice, just to have them not groom and have them not wash their hair because the reality is head lice really like cleaner, healthier hair. And it's an equal opportunity, equal socioeconomic parasite. It is not, I had someone raise their hand in a lecture I was doing on head lice and say, tell me why is it that we see it in kids who are on Medicaid more often? We actually don't see it in kids who have Medicaid more often. It's that when kids are on Medicaid, it's actually less expensive oftentimes for us to prescribe a medication for their head lice than it is for their parents to go out and buy these $30 or $40 treatments over the counter. So it's an equal opportunity parasite. It affects all socioeconomic groups, and it really does prefer the cleaner-haired kids. Now, when you look at this next picture, you're going to see that an adult louse on the right-hand side is about 2 to 3 millimeters long. But I want you to look at the egg, and I want you to look at her baby or the nymph compared to this penny here. And you'll see that the nymphs and the eggs are a millimeter or less in size. They can, they're usually tan to grayish white, but what's very interesting is we now know that these louse can actually transform their color to actually blend in with the hair of their, their host. And so they're not always readily visible. So what happens is when a louse an adult female lays her egg, it is going to lay her egg and it's going to inject a small amount of what we call cement when it lays that egg onto the hair shaft and that's what's going to hold the egg there. But they're always going to lay their egg within a centimeter or so of the scalp and this is a good takeaway message for you tonight. They're going to lay their egg within about a centimeter from the scalp because as soon as that louse or that baby is, uh, breaks out of the shell, it is going to have to take what's called a blood bath. And it's actually going to have to uh, inject small amounts of its saliva into the scalp and it's going to need to suck blood. If it does not suck blood within an hour of its birth, that louse is not going to be able to survive. So the big takeaway message is number one, you're going to look for these nits and the louse at about a centimeter away from the hair, from the scalp. Number two, people often are bagging up their, their uh, beddings, bagging up things for weeks on end. A louse, a lice, lice cannot live more than a day off of the scalp at room temperature. They've got to feed in order to survive. So when people say, can I pick this up from the carpeting? Can I pick this up from bedding? The reality is pretty unlikely because it must feed on every few hours, and if it does not do that, it is not going to survive. So let's take a look here at 
slide six, and this is pretty interesting. So you see that we have the female louse. She's going to lay her egg, and she's going to lay her first egg about one to two days after she mates. And she then, from there forward, is going to lay 10 eggs each day. You can see here that this louse or that this knit is attached to the hair shaft. And the way that happens is it secretes a small amount of cement-like mixture from the vagina of the female louse. It's going to hold that knit on. That, that baby nymph is actually going to bite its shell. It's going to take a deep breath in. It's going to blow backwards. And it's going to extract itself out of that shell or what we often refer to as a knit. It's going to break out. And then it's going to mature. And it becomes an adult about 9 to 12 days after hatching. And, it, and then that female is now able to mate. So you can see here how many eggs get laid in a day. And if every female does this and it lives for three to four weeks, you can see why it's not, why it doesn't take that long to fill this child's head with knits and head louse. So we've all t told our kids, don't share helmets, don't share hats. Please don't share anyone else's brushes. But the reality is most head lights are actually transmitted by head-to-head -head contact with an infested individual. So this is going to be laying in bed in a sleepover. This is going to be putting their head up against someone else as they're hugging them. And you know, I practice in a fairly affluent area in, in New Hampshire, and parents will come in to me and they'll say, I just got this notice from the school, there's a head lice outbreak, I know who gave, or my kid has head lice, I know who gave it to them. That is absolutely not able to be known, and let me tell you why. It takes four to six weeks from the time of exposure for a child who's never had head lice before to actually begin to itch. So for parents to say, this, he just got exposed yesterday or the day before to this kid, that's generally not the case in a kid who has never had head lice before. Now, if a child has had head lice before, the itching can begin as soon as 48 hours after exposure. Uh, so people become sensitized to that itching, and they're going to start to itch, and they're going to start to scratch earlier. Uh, the more episodes they have. But the other big takeaway message from me is that it can take up to four to six weeks for the child who's infested for the first time to actually begin to itch and subsequently scratch. I've given you a picture here. And if you look behind this child's ear, you see there are these black dots here within this black circle. This is actually fecal material. And it's fecal material laid by the lice. And it, it's readily visible here. When we're looking for head lice, the best place to look is behind the ears at the nape of the neck. It's warm, and it's a protected area. If you look up in the white circle, you'll see that there are numerous nits there. And what I love about this picture on the left is this comes from the CDC, is you can see a nit. You can see how attached it is to that hair follicle. That's why when you try to pull a nit off a child's piece of hair, it's really hard to do, and in fact, the cement that that female lays when she lays her egg is so strong that there isn't any chemical known to us as humans that can actually break that bond. That's why often to get nits out of hair, we actually end up pulling the piece of hair out because that cement is so firmly seated. So one of the things we're really trying to do is to get school nurses, to get health care providers, to make a diagnosis of head lice by finding a live louse. Now, I recognize that this is tough for many people to do. It's tough for people to get in. But what happens is the minute someone sees a knit, they assume that this child has active head lice. And the reality is those knits may be there for days and even longer than that after a child has been treated. So what we're asking providers, healthcare professionals, people to do is to make a diagnosis when we find a live louse and keep in mind that if that egg is not attached within a centimeter from the scalp, it's likely not viable. So I recently saw a child that the knit, the eggs, were attached about three centimeters on the hair shaft away from the scalp. 
I knew that these were all dead and non-viable knits. So I think that's an important takeaway message. And parents, I've gotten so many phone calls from parents who say, you know, my kid has head lice, and when the kid comes in, what the child has is dandruff. Or they have material from hairsprays or gels or, or, or products that they're using in their hair. may even be psoriasis or dandruff. So we're really calling on healthcare professionals to really look for a live louse before we re make a recommendation that these family members treat. And the reason is the cost of head lice, both direct and indirect costs, are huge. The average parent treats their child five times before they ever seek care from a healthcare professional. And for any of you that have ever treated your own children with head lice, you know that it's, it's, there's a lot of time. Not only have we in the past had to treat them and everyone in the family gets treated, oftentimes we've had to do the laundry, but we've also spent hours upon hours combing out knits. And so there's a lot of cost. We know that, 12, and this is important to you all, that 12 to 24 million school days are lost every single year because of head lice. And people are often spending this money on over-the-counter products not using them as they're supposed to be used, parents are missing time out of work. So you can see that there is a lot of missed time, both for the parents as well as schools and children in schools. So let's talk about pr approaches to head lice treatment. Oftentimes, before a parent ever comes to me as a healthcare provider, they will go to a school nurse, which is great because school nurses are really amazing with head lice. They often seek consult with other parents, or what a lot of people do is they actually go out to the internet, or they go, you know they Google it and they find all of these different ways to treat. And a lot of the information out there is actually not based in science, nor is it accurate. They may even consult a pharmacist. But I will tell you, in my community, I've had parents say. I would never speak to the pharmacist in my community about head lice because I don't want anyone knowing my kid has head lice. I've had parents actually cross over the border into Massachusetts so that they can pick up medicine for their kids without anyone knowing that their kid has head lice because there is such public anger and frustration and there is a lot of misinformation out there. So let's, about 30% actually consult a healthcare provider, and even when they do, they're often told, try over-the-counter products first, which for a lot of people is really appropriate. But I'm going to tell you tonight that there are other options that may make life a heck of a lot easier for the parents, particularly if they've tried the over-the-counter products and they're not working. So let's start with the over-the-counter products. There are two of them available. The first one is called NYX or permethrin, and the second is called RID, or pyrethrin. So these are available over the counter, and what's really important for all of us on this phone call to know is those products are recommended to be used twice. You treat today, and you treat two weeks later if parents are using those over the counter products. So it's a two-step application separated apart by two weeks. And what the parents should be doing with those products is they should be using a knit comb to comb out the knit. I remember as a child, my parents using Lindane shampoo. We really do not use this any longer. This has a lot of toxicity to it, so it really is kind of outdated and not being used. But our four newest options are ovide, malathione, ulefsia, benzyl alcohol, natroba, which is also known as sinosid, or squice, also known as ivermectin. And these are the treatments that are available to our parents. So let's take a look. As I mentioned to you, and I want to give you some information about the prescriptions, because what often happens is parents will say to you, I'm so frustrated. I've tried these over-the-counter products. It cost me X number of dollars. This is when we all should be referring these parents off to a health care provider. And for my health care providers on the phone, it's really helpful for you to know that there are prescription options that may be easier for them. 
So for instance, you can see that with malathione or oride, it is approved for six years of age and older. They treat once, they leave it on the scalp for eight to 12 hours, and then they only retreat if head lice are present about a week later. What about the benzyl alcohol, Ulepsia? That's approved all the way down to six months of age. They're going to keep it on for 10 minutes. They're going to repeat after seven days. And that's pretty much across the board. What about spinosad or Neutroba, six months of age? And they're going to treat once for 10 minutes, and they only retreat again in seven days if life are still present. And last but not least is ivermectin or splice, indicated six months of age and older. And this is a 10-minute treatment. And many of these prescription products actually do not require that the parents comb out knit. I think that that's an important takeaway message. So you should consult the package insert for all of these to see which ones don't need to comb out knit and which ones do, because I think that really simplifies the regimen. I will also tell you that by the time parents come in to me, they've often also tried a lot of these home remedies. I'm sure you've all heard of people putting mayonnaise on their kids' hair, or putting margarines, or petroleum jellies. And probably the newest remedy is the Cetaphil cleanser that we've used for years for kids with eczema. Um, and this is a protocol that's coming out of California that people are using uh, to help get rid of head lice. What I think is a big takeaway message is that most of these have not been scientifically studied. And when people say, well, how good is mayonnaise? I know that the placebo arm in the clinical trials of most of those products that I just talked to you about had about a 17% lice eradication with placebo. So, and placebo was the medium that the drug is contained in, but no drug. So when people say, how effective is mayonnaise? My gut is probably like the placebo arms in the clinical trials, which may be as effective as 17%. What is really sprung up around the nation are what we call nitpicking salons. And we actually have one here. Uh, I take care of a camp every summer. And the first day of camp, despite everything I tell them to not to do, they still bring in, uh, they still bring in these nitpickers, and they're called desperate nitpickers. That's their business. And they come in, there are four of them, and for $100 an hour, they go through these kids' heads and they pick out nits. And they'll use all kinds of uh, over-the-counter products. The problem with these nitpicking salons is, or these companies that have sprung up, is A, they're not regulated. Number two, they may be doing things to kids and kids' hair that may be harmful. And they're really expensive. So not everyone can certainly afford to have their kids go to these nitpicking salons. When we look at how kids are actually treated for, uh, for head lice, you will see, sorry, things keep popping up on my screen. You will see that over-the-counter products is really where most people go. And then home remedies and natural products are next. And then, uh, and then other services. You can see, though, that most people actually use over-the-counter products. They don't have to visit a health care provider, and they can just walk into the pharmacy and they can purchase these. Now, let's go. All right. So, sorry, I'm going to just take us back one slide. So why are some treatments not effective? Well, one of the biggest reasons that treatment is not effective is they didn't have head lice to begin with. But people freak out and they say, oh, there's an outbreak in the school, so I'm going to treat my kids. Well, treating them before they have head lice is not going to be effective. People think it is, but it isn't. Number two, it may have been dandruff. But what we are actually, what we also know is if a regimen calls to be done twice and to comb knits for the next two weeks, people often don't do that. Life is busy. In the evening, it's crazy. We all know that. There's so much going on. You have homework, you have dinner, I call it the witching hour, and then add on, you know, the treatment of head lice, it gets really difficult. We also know that there is increasing treatment resistance, and what I would tell you is not one treatment product out there is 100% uh, effective, and we know that none of them are 100% ovicidal, meaning killing the nit. There has been resistance reported with many of the products that are used, but particularly the OTC products 
such as RID and NYX or pyrethrin and permethrin. So this is not unanticipated. We've all been watching what's going on with antimicrobial resistance and antibiotic resistance. It makes sense to us that the same thing is happening with head lice. The actual prevalence of resistance to different products is really not known, and it can actually vary regionally. Probably one of the best studies to actually take a look at resistance was conducted in 2009. And it was a comparison of something known as phenosid, Natroba, compared to 1% permethrin, known as NIT. They had NIT combing, and they looked at 1,000 patients. And you can see here that 14 days after treatment, and they did everything in the protocol they were supposed to do, anywhere from 42 to 44% of people treated with over-the-counter NIC were lights free. Compare that to 85 to 86 percent of the folks that took phenosid that, was actually, that were actually life, life free. And in terms of the spinosid, most people only used one application. So it just goes to show that despite telling people that this is what we need to do, they need to do, there is some resistance out there. And in fact, if you take a look at the declining efficacy of the over-the-counter product permethrin, you can see that in a 20-year span, the percent of patients that were life-free after treatment have gone from almost 100% in 1998 down to almost 30% in 2009. That's scary. And because, again, these are products people are buying, and they're expecting them to work. So what's happening, and why is there resistance? There's resistance because there is a genetic mutation. It's called knockdown resistance. And this was actually published in a, a you know, it's been talked about pretty frequently. But I've given you the reference here at the bottom of the slide. And you can see that, there, that this knockdown mutation has caused resistance to both permethrin and pyrethrum. And this may be why we are seeing treatment failure. And in fact, the authors of the study concluded it's time to look at different approaches for head lice. They're critically needed. This was a, a map, actually, from this study that showed the location in the United States and how the resistance rates are, or how resistant the head lice are to these products. And you can see the entire eastern seaboard is all bright red. That means resistant. You can see that the yellow bars are actually susceptible, and there are not a lot of locations left. So as I am wrapping up and getting toward the end of my program, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the role of the healthcare provider in head lice management. And I use that term healthcare provider, but that really includes every single one of us in this room that are working with children. So the first thing is, you know, as I talk with triage nurses in offices, they'll say, but we don't want these kids coming into the office. My philosophy is I would much rather have a, head lice, a kid with head lice come into the office than a kid with influenza. Head lice are not going to jump off of another child's head and get into mine or my staff. So when we have a parent who says, I think my kid has head lice, what we are asking them to do in our clinic is to come on in and let us verify this. Now remember, by the time they call me, they've already tried five products on average. But what we're trying to do is look for the presence of a live louse. Because nits do not mean that they have active head lice. Those nits may absolutely never hatch, and they may be dead. As I mentioned to you, there is the emergence of resistance, and people need to know about this. When a parent calls and is frustrated, maybe it's time that we go to another option for these parents. And I think it's imperative that all of us in this room know that head lice treatment is not just always over the counter, that for some parents, it may actually be more cost effective for us to give them a prescription for whichever product, uh, whichever product you're, we are all comfortable with. And there's no head to head. It's not that one of these products is any better, better than the other, but it's important for us to know that the over the counter products require two applications, two weeks each application two weeks apart and require nick combing, and people don't do that. So 
We try never to make a diagnosis and treat over the phone. We really like to look, and I tell parents, if the entire, if, if no one else in the house is infected, it does you no good to treat all household members. If they become infected, then you treat them. But to treat them before they have nits or live louse, it's not going to work. I also like to, as I mentioned to you, consider cost because sometimes it's less expensive. Give them a prescription that it is for them to buy things over the counter. And the over-the-counter products in some communities are still effective and can work if they're used appropriately. Now, in terms of finding out information on resistance, as I mentioned to you, we don't really have a lot of widespread information available to us about different communities and, and resistance, but you can talk to your public health departments, your universities. Some of them may have information available on head lice resistance to different products. I think one of the most important things that has happened in the last four or five years has really been the teaming together or coming together of the AAP, American Academy of Pediatrics, with the National Association of School Nurses. And they issued a policy where they state that no healthy child should be excluded from school or allowed to miss school time because of head lice. That the no nit policies need to, re need to be abandoned. That these are keeping way too many kids out of school. And I want to tell you a story about a large school system that is, is close in close proximity to me. Despite the medical director of that large school system with thousands and thousands of kids presenting to the school board and telling them that there's no evidence that exists to keep these kids out of school once they've been treated, the school board has voted year after year after year to continue the no-net policies. And the only thing that we can think of is they just don't want to deal with the angry parents and the frustrated parents. And I get that. But I also like to think about how much time these kids are missing. What are they missing academically? And I take care of a lot of parents who have to miss a lot of work to deal with these head lice. In fact, so it took a number of years. This school system finally dropped their no nip policy last year after a lot of petitioning to do that. They've tracked, they've tracked uh, head lice in the school system this year and there were no higher outbreaks than there had been in previous years. So at the end of the day, these no nit policies are not helpful. We also know that there is no benefit to lining these children up at the first week of school and going through their heads to look for head lice. That these type of programs ha are not cost effective and they have an improved outcome. And so we really need to work with the school systems and, and help our educators, because I get a lot of people who say, the teacher didn't want my child in their classroom. So I think it's incumbent upon all of us to, to understand this evidence so that these children are not excluded from school. So as, again, I wrap up, encourage the parents to consult with health care providers on the treatment of head lice. Talk to the school nurses. Get useful, accurate information. We all need to take an active role in both diagnosing and treating head lice and to help these families who are struggling and searching. I mean, we all read every year about families who find head lice in a child and they put kerosene on their child's head or they use gasoline. These are frightening treatments and people are still doing these. And all of us need to work together, me as a primary care provider, you as teachers and school nurses and educators, we all need to come together to try to come up with a concrete, effective, but evidence-based plan to help these families out. You can take a look here on this last slide. There's some great information and great resources for all of you about where you can get the information on head lice. These are helpful resources not only for parents, but also for all of us that work in this arena. So my time is concluded. I wanted to make sure that we left enough time now so that I may answer any questions you may have. And I'm wondering if um, either Lee or Linda 
have any questions that have been typed in for me by the audience that I, I can answer. I, again, I know it's a really busy evening. I, like you, have been at work all day. I really do appreciate all of you that came out to join us this evening and to try to find a, bit, a better way to manage head life. Thank you all so very much. Thank you so much, Wendy. This was a really great presentation. Um, I Now that I have control back from you for the computer screen, um, I'm checking through, and we have quite a number of questions, so I'm just... Um, checking to make sure that I can field some for you that, that, you, that I know that you can answer. Um, okay, so um, let's see. Okay, this, this question is, um, it says that Nick's instructions in box notes that it kills lice and eggs. As a result, I have many parents confused thinking it will kill the nits and they do not have to comb out the eggs. As a result, I spend a lot of time educating parents and explaining that the product box is not exactly accurate and the instructions advise to nitpick. So I think that's... And that's... Okay, go ahead. Yep. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And thank you for that question because you're exactly right. When the product, when the package says, you know, it kills... It kills head lice, it kills nits. Remember what I said to you. It may kill nits, but none of them are 100% ovicidal. So there are still potentially going to be nits left with those over-the-counter products. With some of the newer prescription products, the, parent, the clinical trials, they actually didn't comb out nits. And they looked at rates of head lice two weeks later, and we found that even though they didn't comb out nits, that there was actually fairly high number of kids who didn't have head lice two weeks later. So with that said, I think you're absolutely right. They, A, need to treat twice if they're using an over-the-counter product, and two, they do need to comb out nits with those products. And again, we can't blame the fact that those products didn't work necessarily on the fact that they didn't comb out nits. Remember, they may not have worked because there may be resistance to those products in the community. Okay, great. Um, here's someone just um, sharing kind of what they do in their school. It says, if we see head lice, we send students home until they receive their first treatment. Is this okay? Also, we no longer send letters home to inform parents that a student was found with lice to prevent hysteria. Is this standard? So the no letter home to parents, absolutely standard. Uh, many schools are abandoning, abandoning that. There are still schools out there, believe it or not, that are putting this on the door. As your parent is walking in to drop off their kid, it says a case of head lice. You know, it, I can understand if we're dealing with meningitis. Uh, I can understand if we're dealing with measles. I cannot understand that when they're dealing with head lice. So I think you're right on. Don't send the letters home because you know what? There's head lice in schools every single year. Mm -hmm. It's going to create hysteria. And number two... Uh, sending kids home, many people, many schools are now allowing the kid to stay through the end of the day, not sending them home, because remember, just because you found them doesn't mean that they haven't been there for days. You're just going to instruct them, keep your head away from other kids, you need to get treated overnight, and then those kids can come back into the school tomorrow. That's how many schools are starting to move toward this. Okay, great. Um... What do you suggest a school nurse do for a child whose parent absolutely refuses to treat her child at home? I've been combing and picking regularly, and it's been four to five weeks. So it sounds like the nurse is, is doing the work of, that the parents should be doing. Yeah, so if a child is not being treated, so this makes it a sticky wicket because at the end of the day, it is going to increase the likelihood that other kids are going to be infected. You know, what should you do as a school nurse? I want to know why they won't treat. Is it a cost issue? Because if it's a cost issue, maybe they could go, uh, maybe they could call their health care provider. And if you go to any of those prescription drugs and you go .com, there often is a copay card to reduce that. Are, do they not know how to do that? Do they not want to treat everyone else? Are they worried they're going to have to treat everyone else in the family? So I'd really like to get at what 
the reason behind this? And you know what, I, my, what my gut is from that question is they're scared about the side effects of these drugs and about exposing to their, their kids to these products. Because, again, when they hear antiparasitic, you know, they get very, very nervous. One of the things I often say is, do you have a dog? Do you have an animal? Because if you do have a dog or an animal, you know that heartworm medicine that your dog eats orally? We have one of those available to actually put topically. And I'll say to them, do you know that they give this in other countries to prevent a condition called river blindness? Kids chew this readily. And I'm asking you to just put it on your kid's scalp for 10 minutes. I'm not asking for them to eat it. So oftentimes what it requires is just a little bit of education because they're very fearful about the side effects. Okay. Um, this, here's a question about another kind of a drug. It's, the person says, a local practitioner is prescribing an oral medication which eliminates parasites and supposedly head lice. How do you feel about or oral medications and if any are effective? So there is some information out there. You may have heard over the years that people are giving patients things like trimethoprim, sulfamethoxazole, or Bactrim. Some people are prescribing oral equivalents of some of these products. I really think that I really don't love giving an oral product to treat something that is purely topical. I don't recommend it. I think it's a convenience issue for families, but I think it's also exposing people orally to a drug that we could use topically with less systemic absorption. That's my gut. Okay, great. Thank you. That's a, I think that's a really, there's a, there's a few folks asking about that particular drug. Here's one from a new school nurse who says she has parents always asking where do nits come from. Can you help her answer that? Or? The question, Lee, was where do nits come from? Well, I guess we, we you answered that question. They come from the, the, the females, but I guess... Right, they come from the female louse, and she lays 10 of those a day, and she lives for four weeks. And then each one of those grows up and becomes a female or a male, and then they mate. And each one of those lays those eggs. So that's where they come from. They come from a live louse that's laying their eggs to yeah. replicate. Yeah, and, you know, I'm a parent myself. So, I mean, I think we all just kind of want to know, like, but but if we're all eradicating it, you know, where, where does that first one come from? But I guess it's just there's always one that, you know, that you, you, we never fully eliminate them, I guess, and... and and I think that that's absolutely true, and it just takes one or two, right? It right. takes a couple, and they're, they're, they may have already been pregnant, and then they're going to lay their eggs. So I think um, there's not, not one product out there, and this is true with vaccines. This is true with antibiotics. There's not one product out there that's perfect. And so it's often, let's try this product. You've already gone this route. I think the important thing for me, Lee, is that people have the knowledge so that when these parents are frustrated, A, they can understand why, and B, they can refer them to appropriate people who can help these parents to not be doing this time and time again. I have a family who has five kids. $30 times five kids, well, for a lot of people, that's a week's worth of pay. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, um, I have a question uh, asking about dogs and cats. Can you dispel the myth that dogs and cats can get head lice? Dogs and cats do not get head lice. Okay, and on a related note, uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> there's a lot yeah, of pet questions coming in. Lee, before, you, before I go on from that question, okay. I know head lice is a really big topic and people are always, they have a million questions, um, but I, I just want to dispel a couple of other myths. So dogs and cats don't get head lice, so your animals are not going to carry head lice. And in fact, the other thing that's really important is some of the lowest rates of head lice are actually found in African Americans. And the reason is that the hair shaft is more oval shaped. It's, it's not shaped like a hair shaft in a Caucasian individual. And as a result, head lice cannot adhere. The nits can't adhere. And the head lice can't adhere as well. So we see a lot less, uh, a lot less head lice in African American kids than we do in Caucasian kids. Okay. So um, was that, you were kind of on a stream of talking about myths. Was, is there a myth? Another myth you were going to mention? 
we no, about? I think the big myth is, is just about the dogs, cats, and I think also educating why it is that we see a lot less in African-American children. Okay, great. Um, and then uh, someone talked about do or dog shampoo. They said that, that they've heard that that's now added to the list of home remedies. But I'm sure, you know, I always joke with my staff and say the sure way to go from a mild headache to your death is to Google something, right? right. Because within 15 seconds you think you're dying of, of an aneurysm. And this is what happens is people go out onto the internet and they search head lice and there's no regulation of this. And so people will search and they'll find things and it's scary. I mentioned the, the oil, the gasoline. People put these on their kids' scalp to get rid of this. Right. That's crazy. Okay, um, how about this question? Can head lice eventually die out, or is treatment always needed? Head lice can eventually die out. So, like, if you they have may... a kid that has hundreds of active lice on their head, they could actually die out? Well, they can, but it's going to be weak. I mean, there are kids that never get treated, right? So you would think that if we, if we had kids, not every child is going to be treated for head lice. Because A, they don't know that they have them. B, parents choose not to treat. So in some kids, it's like the vinegar. I, I mean, it's like the mayonnaise. Why does mayonnaise make 17% maybe of head lice go away? Maybe they just die out on their own. Maybe they're suffocated. Maybe they're killed by treatments that we do. Maybe they got lucky. But yes, there are kids that if they don't get treated, it can potentially go away. Now, I can't tell you if that's one louse or if that's 500, but we do know that not every child gets treated, and they don't keep head lice for the rest of their lives. Yeah. I mean, one of the treatments that's being used in these hair salons is heat. They're putting these kids under an intense heating cap. So does blow drying kill some of these? Who knows? Right. Who knows? Um, and so, yeah, there are going to be kids that they'll go away. Wow. Okay. Uh, we have lots of questions, and many of them are lengthy, so I'm just trying to make sure that I, I pitch them to you in a, in a good way. Um, okay, yes. Okay. Someone asked about African American children, and they said, "Is it a myth that lice is less likely in African American children because they use hair oil and Caucasian do not?" But I think that is a myth. Yeah. It has nothing to do with hair oil whatsoever. It has to do with the shape of their shaft, and those claws that are found on the lice cannot attach themselves to that oval um, shaft or to that that shaft that is just not circular like a Caucasian hair shaft. Mm -hmm. Okay. We've had, oh, someone asked if we could get a copy of the prescription lice products, and a lot of folks have, um, a lot of folks have asked about getting the slides because people really want to be able to take this back and, and share it with their colleagues. Um, and so I'm going to let you work that out. Yeah. Um, this is your program, so if you want to make those available as a handout, I'm fine by that, but you'll need to run it by your credit, you know, your, your sources. Right, right, and we'll look into that. Um, I think that we'll probably be able to share this um, after the fact with, with all of our attendees. We're getting some questions about tea tree oil. Can you address tree oil. the herbal treatment used with tea tree oil, rosemary, or peppermint oil? Yeah, so again, what I would tell you is that's one more of those of herbal remedies that people are doing. People are using tea tree oil, aloe. I mean, there are so many of them out there. What I would tell you is, again, once again, no well-controlled trials, no double-blinded placebo-controlled trials. That's not to say that they don't work, but again, how much do they work? How frustrated will the parents be? It's the same story that I just presented to you with mayonnaise. Right. Um, somebody, okay, so I'm not sure. I, somebody says that, that you have been calling this an infection. 
Have you been using the word infection or infestation? Well, you know, sometimes when we speak, it's like a back, outer body experience, and it's at 8 o'clock at night. So if I've been calling it an infection, I'm sorry. I know I referred to infections when I was speaking about antibiotics, uh -huh. but it's an infestation. Okay. So I think they just wanted clarification. They wanted to know if, if, you, tru if you truly meant infection, why? And okay. So if I've been saying that, my deepest apologies. Sure, sure. Okay, thank you. Um, so, <laughs> um, okay, so let's see. Somebody asked about institutional outbreaks. Are there any special me measures that should be taken? Not at all. Nothing different than what you do when you have an outbreak in a school. You treat the kids that are infected. Nothing different. Okay, um, do we need to wash clothes, hats, combs, and hot water and soap after an infestation occurs? Yes, we do. We need to, uh, we need to wash the standard head lice protocol. So wash the hat, soak the, uh, soak the combs, the brushes. And if they can't want launder anything, they can put it into a garbage bag, tie up the garbage bag, leave it bagged up, Remember, they die after a day, but leave them for a week, and no head louse or lice are going to survive that. Okay. Yeah, that's that's something that, you know, is, I think, a little bit confusing because, you know, you do, you hear a week, but then after your presentation today, it, it's clear that a day is sufficient. So um, It is. But none of us really want to say a day because, remember, there could be, uh, there could be a different it could fall off at different times. Mm -hmm. So I think to just go a week, years ago we said two weeks, but we really have now the evidence that one day is probably sufficient, but all of us are like, you know what, if you come this far, bag it up for a week. And then we know there's no way this survived. Okay, great. Um, somebody said, how about putting, putting the clothes in a dryer on high for 30 minutes? I mean, is that gonna be less effective than putting it in a bag? So they can certainly do that, but again, they're not going to live off the body anyways. And so put them in a dryer and keep them away from, from being worn again or up around the hair. Again, clothes, once, once they fall off, they're not going to survive. I am not worried about clothes. What am I worried about? I'm worried about hat or helmet, even though it's less common that way. I'm worried about putting their head next to someone else. That is the most common route of transmission. Yeah, I think that was a really good takeaway today. Um, on a related note, and I, I can attest to this question, as being affiliated with a, a little child's uh, baseball team, um, do you suggest spraying team helmets after use? I do not. Okay. I do not. Because, again, once they're off their head, they're not going to survive more than a day. Okay. The answer is no. Okay, great. Um, on, a, uh, on a related note, does it make sense for, for parents to have their own baseball hel helmets, batting helmets? I mean, I think that if a parent can afford it, mm -hmm. that's what I did with my kid, mm -hmm. just to be safe, even mm -hmm. though it's pretty rare, mm -hmm. I just always said I'm bringing my own helmet. Mm -hmm. And I could do that, because right. uh, I could afford to do that. It's expensive for a lot of people. Right. And you know what? Even when my kid brought his own helmet, he's a typical boy. If it wasn't ready when he was up to bat, he couldn't find it. He just grabbed whatever he could find. Right. <laughs> so, I mean, and he's no different than most other kids. But that's what I said to him was, you know what? Let's get you your own helmet. Please just wear it. Let's do what we can to minimize the exposure. But, uh, but they, you know, they often don't do that. And it's expensive, again, to do that. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I all right. Okay. Yeah. I'm just going to make just a couple of concluding remarks yes, before go we go away. Again, one more time, I want to thank you all so much for your time with me tonight. I hope that I've really given you some good information, given you uh, some information to dispel these myths and to take back to your school system so that we can transform the care of kids with life. So thank you all so much, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of the week.
Thank you so much, Wendy. And I know a lot of you had, I mean, we had so many questions um, asking about the slides and if, if you all would have access to the presentation. Um, and we certainly will be sharing an email with you at the, at least by the end of this week that you'll receive that will include a link to the recording of this webinar. And um, I'm 99% sure that we can also share a link to a PDF of this presentation. So we will be following up with those resources and hopefully you can share those broadly with your colleagues and um, parents and you know, whomever um, so that you can, can help dispel some of these myths and help uh, make school a, a place for learning and ensure that more children are in school. Thank you also to Linda Morse, the ASHA president, who helped, um, help us, helped us understand how LICE um, is related to the whole school, whole community, whole child model. Um, look for the email from us when you, when you close out today. You'll receive a survey, and we really hope that you can help answer some of our questions. Thank you so much, and have a great day.